So nationalism and internationalism is on the agenda for panel number two, and we have uh, uh, three presenters, respondents, uh, Nicola Miller, uh, first from University College London, who's worked on nationalism uh, quite a bit. She has a book, Republics of Knowledge, Nations of the Future in Latin America, uh, that just came out with Princeton University uh, Press. Uh, Glenda Sluga, who's um, teaching at Florence, where else, uh, after a short stint in Sydney. A short stint in Sydney, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> who's worked extensively on internationalism, like uh, in her book, Internationalism in the Age of Nationalism, um, that came out in 2013, and I'll quote from that in a second. And Sandrine Cott, who is the global actor she's talked about recently, but she's also a local actor, meaning that she teaches here at the university in Geneva. She has uh, you know, all kinds of <clears throat> works to her credit, even a biography of Bismarck, uh, but then a book that came out this year, <coughs> Organiser le Monde, um, A Different Alternative History of the Cold Wars. Um, all right, uh, who better uh, to address this question than the three of you? Um, we, yeah, we have a set of uh, questions. We'll start with the first one, um, which, is, uh, which builds on Glenda Sluga's 2013 work and actually asks, where she, where she says that internationalism has been much less theorized than nationalism, actually. Um, that's 2013, now we are in 2021. Is that still the case? Are we still in that situation? Or have things um, uh, turned? Um, but, but more broadly speaking, in terms of the economy of attention in the field, uh, is, um, is there much more public but also academic interest in nationalism than in internationalism? Are, are you all getting the credit that you deserve for your work on internationalism would be um, uh, part of the question. Um, have, has nationalism sidelined internationalism, essentially, is, is the question. So I'd, I'm curious to hear from you what you're thinking. Nicola, you want to get us started? Thanks very much, Sebastian. Um, thanks. To Michael for the invitation. It's one of the many upsides of getting older that you get to see what your graduate students get up to and sometimes get involved in their wonderful activities. So that's a great pleasure to be here. I'm basically, as Sebastian sort of alluded to, interested in intellectual history and the history of knowledge. Um, so my, some of my takes will come from that perspective rather than international history um, per se. In thinking about the first question of the theorization of the term international, I think intellectual historians have made some contributions here over the last decade or so since um, David Armitage um, wrote his famous article about the inter international turn in intellectual history. Um, I think there has been a lot of valuable work um, trying to historicize and denaturalize the, both the term the national um, but alongside that, the international uh, and the global, and also perhaps even more thinking about the universal. So all, how, all, how all those sort of terms relate to each other, I think perhaps we have a, a body of historiography now um, that helps us to um, entangle, uh, some of, disentangle some of those um, questions. A second point I wanted to make, which didn't come up in the first panel, but I think it's probably relevant to um, everything we're talking about um, over the next couple of days, actually, in terms of the economic, uh, academic organization, is the, the point about area studies, um, which um, you know, is, is, is still in many ways, and in some, point, some respects for good reason, um, a, 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 a sort of source of this kind of compartmentalized approach to history that um, Sebastian was, was talking about. And of course, most of the movements have been against that. And some of those have come within area studies itself. But the kind of institutional weight of area studies in some places, and also the vulnerability of many of the scholars working in area studies, um, particularly those working in humanities fields, I think means there's a kind of defensiveness around area studies that perhaps acts at least institutionally to mitigate against thinking across those kind of boundaries. So I think that's a, a relevant factor, although perhaps not directly concerned with internationalism. And then a, th a third point, if I, if I have, a, have time, Sebastian, would be um, 
in thinking, and one area that, from the point of view of a Latin Americanist, is very clearly internationalist in scope, is economic, <coughs> excuse me, economic nationalism, um, which seems also to be really important, increasing importance around the globe now, particularly in relation to all the environmental problems and all the rest of it. And I think that is an area that is under theorized, I would say, um, and is so often framed um, at least in the Latin American perspective, but you could transfer it elsewhere as, as a bilateral contest um, a bit over sovereignty uh, between the United States and whichever country, other country in the Americas is being talked about, or um, imperial powers and uh, other countries in, in other parts of the world. So at that, I would say, is something that is, 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 is still quite badly under-theorized um, and still thought about mostly in quite an old-fashioned way, apart from some work by anthropologists thinking about kind of indigenous um, responses. Um, so that's an era I would suggest is one that, that needs more research and thought. Thank you. Glenda. And what should everyone else do? Does anyone have their work? Just, just speak, just speak. Don't, oh, you don't need to do anything. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was just performative, but it doesn't change anything. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, I guess I want to start by uh, just uh, thinking about um, in, you know, the confusion of terms a bit. And I, and I noticed this when we talked about nationalism earlier on. So we've got international history and internationalism. We've got uh, nation states and nationalism. And I think what we've got, uh, and, and particularly when we put it in the context of, say, global history, so we've got sites of history and we've got subjectivities. and. Um, Possibly what we haven't talked about very much is subjectivities. But if I, just to start, I'd say that, you know, in, what's interesting to me is that in history, in comparison to the social sciences more generally, and, you know, there may be non-historians in the room who challenge this, but I do think that um, historians are either ahead or behind the times in focusing on the international at the moment. And whether they're thinking about the international, you know, and David's work or the new kind of work on women in international thought, that's coming out amongst intellectual historians, and operating in both um, IR and in history. So there's a lot of cross-IR history work going on. Um, there we're looking at the international, but otherwise, I, I, sociologists and anthropologists and others, political scientists, I think have kind of associated the international with the 20th century and thought we move on to the global. And even the global now, of course, has become so entangled in globalisation that um, there is a search for new kinds of ways of thinking, and Cyrus mentioned planetary, which I think is really in, you know, engaging and interesting. And of course, historians are also working in that space. But we are rather unique, I think. And one of the reasons why the social sciences abandoned uh, the international, let alone internationalism, which they do not look at, um, is because they see it as trapped in the national, what, what uh, you know, Ulrich Beck calls the national international logic, right? And, and while I'm not disputing that logic, in fact, I think, you know, historically that's exactly what you find when you start looking at um, the, the, the origins of, you know, think back origins, or the chronology of the origins of, of ideas of nation and international, they coincide, they speak to each other, they're entangled, if we go back to, you know, the theme of this whole conference. But um, the, what both, I think, history and social sciences share is um, uh, um, the, the problem of the state as, as kind of retreating on the horizon. So where do we put the state in all this and should we bring it back in and to what extent? And I think that was also you know, very pertinent to the, question, the economic question that the cultist um, raised. So the, the second point I'd make is that um, you know, internationalism is not studied by global historians. It is studied by international historians. So it's kind of become a definition of the new international history as I, as I like to think about it. And there's a lot of work on it, right? I'm amazed how many people are now writing about it. I don't think it's theorised. Um, and I think um, that's problematic because we're still relying, I suppose, on a lot of the theorisations of nation that um, uh, set it up in opposition to the international uh, and that, that don't allow us, I suppose, to um, not to challenge the idea of the national international logic, but actually to see some other possibilities in this new... Uh, history of internationalism and international history. First of all, I think um, you could argue that global history has a genealogy that is the product of the history of internationalism. So, you know, if you take the 1940s and that engagement of 
you know, Fèvre, um, uh, Lucien Fèvre with the idea of a world history, the Papier, or is it Mondial or something, I can't remember now, but uh, using UNESCO as a site for uh, generating a new kind of history journal. Uh, that, is, that is looking at the world and the globe. That is a product of a particular kind of moment of internationalism. You know, a very specific, that I do think is characteristic of the 20th century, not the 21st, of course, but nevertheless. So they're different sort of animals, if you like. Um, and, and in that sense, too, I think if we're doing this kind of methodological conceptual spring cleaning, it's really nice to remember um, the, the long history of historical engagement uh, in this space, in this, as a product of internationalism in the 20th century, I think, uh, of engagement with the idea of the nation and nationalism. And I'm trying to understand the culpability and responsibility of historians in reproducing rather than interrogating the terms. Now that can go on at different levels, and I guess that's partly what um, we need to think about in our own practices. But I do remember, you know, in my own career, I started off as a historian of nationalism, and I ended up um, making the decision to, to, to refocus because I thought I wasn't seeing other things, right? So it's part of a, a sense of a responsibility to the past, to being less anachronistic in a way that one then uh, looked at um, in the international and internationalism uh, in that context. So uh, I just, the last thing I want to say is, I think we do need to theorize, re-theorize both the national and international war because once you start looking at the national theories of nationalism, you just can put in internationalism or other concepts and find that it operates just as well. So there's something wrong with our theorizations um, and, uh, when they're not very specific to the national, and we think it explains everything about nationalism. And, this, and the second thing then, also the last point is, you know, how gendered our practices are becoming, um, to suggest in terms of who gets associated with global history. And I'm not saying this in a, in a but I just think it's interesting, right, as an observation. And, uh, and I'm not saying it. Um, you haven't said it yet, you need to say I it. I will say <laughs> it, <laughs> but, but other people say it, right, other people say it. But the extent to which global history is associated with male historians and, in fact, the history of internationalism with, with women, I'm sorry to the men who do it, but it is, it is fact. that's why we have three women here and three men. But as an observation, I don't know if it means anything. And it's not by chance, yeah. Mm. You're all the reality. Yeah, Sandrine, can you sympathize with that last comment or with anything that's been said? No, I do because I've been in conferences with Glenda very often. <laughs> <laughs> We are always a bunch, of, a, bunch, a bunch of women together on internationalism and no men. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I just have to follow up what Glenda and what Nicola was, uh, were saying. And I just, because I'm a, I'm a historian who likes case studies and so on, you know, I'm a, uh, so I will speak from my perspective of social state and the social state, and I never say welfare state because it is really situated in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, and I want to be really global and not Anglo-Saxon global, <laughs> so uh, I will use social state. And um, I think that it's a very good case study to, 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 to look at this tension between national and international. Because, of course, you know, it's interesting to look at the way this field of study has developed. In fact, this field of study has developed nationally and internationally together. Exactly what you were saying, Glenda. And uh, then we have to ask, what, did, what, what does it mean for people in the, in, 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 in the various, people, uh, various periods to work on the social state internationally? And then you have four steps, I would say. The first step is a comparison. You know, the people in 19th century, in particular in the Bismarck Reich, the Kaiser Reich, when they were doing their own national, and they were very nationalistic about it, you know, social state, they were looking at what other people were doing. They were comparing all the time. So it's not that they were completely narrowly nationalist. They were nationalist and internationalist in the same time, by comparing, by comparing. It was the first thing. And then, you know, social scientists have compared. Uh, let's think about uh, uh, Peter Flora and other things, uh, other people who have, uh, since the 1980s uh, um, and, and even before, they have compared. The second step was, from this comparison, you make typologies. 
typologies are also international, Esping, Anderson, and so on. So you group, and it, was, it, it goes back to your structures. Um, it, they group, you know, the social state uh, as uh, models, and there are several international models. And, and if you enter, of course, as an historian, I don't agree with the typology, but it doesn't matter. It's interesting that they want to study national so social state through models, through patterns, which are international. That's another way of being international and national together. The third step is, uh, is the circulation. So the circulation of experts and so on, so that's uh, uh, Daniel Rogers, and uh, even before, uh, we, we forget about Alan Mitchell and French and, and, and the German and so on and so forth. So you have the circulation story. It's international because it is circulating, because there are flows and so on and so forth. And the fourth step, the step we are now, so places of internationalization as a, as a dynamics, and that the ILO International Labour Organization, other international organizations, that's an a new, a new step uh, towards this kind of national, international uh, uh, thing. And then, you know, I studied, and it's, it will be my last remark, I studied how the German social state got internationalized through international organization and then denationalized. So again, a new dialectic between national and international, looking at international organization. I know, Sebastian, that you are not convinced by international organization, but I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> Yeah, because we had this discussion before. Of course, we know each other, all of them. All of them. And, uh, but, you know, it's a, it's a new way of entering this kind of, that, that, uh, of dialectic, uh, dialectical relation. So, in a way, we are not, we are, we are not inventing... We, we, I don't want to reinvent the wheel all the time, you know. In fact, there are new ways of doing this kind of dialectic, but are, it has always been with us in a certain way. So, that's what I wanted to say. Thanks a lot. Sandrine, I would never say something like that. <laughs> you told me that. At one. least in Geneva. <laughs> Not in Geneva, but in Berlin, yeah. All right, that was an interesting first round, I think. Um, in some ways, it's already provincialized the first panel. The first panel was on nationalism and global history. We've learned from Glenda that global history was actually the product of internationalism, UNESCO after World War II. Uh, what about nationalism? We've also learned that she moved from being a historian of nationalism to a historian of internationalism in order to be less anachronistic. <clears throat> all right, so let's, let's briefly, all three of you, look back from this less anachronistic moment to this earlier moment. So in other words, how is internationalism and nationalism linked? Um, and obviously, they are the, the internationalist movements since the 19th century, essentially build on national delegates right, to international organizations. And the UN, just around the corner somewhere here, uh, is built on that very same principle. But, but from that, you know, f building on that scholarship of, on internationalism recently, and uh, some of you have mentioned these exciting new, new avenues being pursued, do we also, I mean, do we understand internationalism better? Sh certainly. But do we also understand nationalism mm -hmm. uh, better or in a different light? That would be the question. Mm -hmm. um, same order, or do you want yeah, to shuffle? Yeah, same order, same order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nicola. <laughs> I'm like, I guess, as, as a Latin Americanist, um, it's almost impossible not to think about nationalism in an international context, um, because right from the beginning, um, the, the two were um, very closely imbricated, and you, as the 19th century goes on, you have liberal nation builders very self-consciously positioning themselves as participating in a kind of international uh, would be universal project. So it's impossible, really, from my background, to, to think, um, not to think of, of the two as always in, in relation to each other. I think I would say that over the last couple of decades, um, there's been a huge sort of enrichment of, of many of these questions from cultural history uh, as well as intellectual history. I think the problem is that much of this work doesn't directly address the question of either nationalism or internationalism. But there is a pool of material there. Um, just thinking about the idea of, of comparisons, which was talked about in the first panel, and how you know historians have long thought about how nations um, conceptualize themselves uh, in comparison with other nations, whether they wanted to identify or they wanted to distance themselves. 
But I think um, there's, been, uh, there's been a sort of deepening and enrichment of, of that kind of work from cultural history, thinking about the shifting matrices of references, the shared archives, common repertoires of knowledge, or unshared um, repertoires of knowledge. Um, and, and for example, all the work that there's been on international exhibitions and world fairs, this is, this is really quite a huge literature, which actually is of, I think, quite powerful resonance for historians of nationalism, um, thinking about how nations choose to present themselves for external consumption is quite an important question, but it tends not to be brought in, I think, to um, history of nationalism per se. Um, one other area where I think intellectual history is contributing um, is in, in opening up channels for thinking about exchanges that don't necessarily go through Europe. Obviously, well, there's been a lot of work about exchanges of ideas and uh, products mediated through Europe, but now there are beginning, there is beginning to be a really exciting uh, pool of work that's thinking about exchanges of ideas between, say, someone in Bolivia and someone in Algeria and someone in India. Um, opening up to, and, and, and sort of changing, reversing what you were talking about, Sebastian, that, that sort of inverse Eurocentrism, um, trying to, to break that down. So I think um, there's, a lot, um, there's a lot going on in, in all those respects that um, is really relevant to history of nationalism, even though historians of nationalism don't always engage closely with, the, with that kind of cultural history. Okay, so if we go, if I, I think if we go back to the, um, you know, the fundamentally, your point, Nicole, about the fundamentally entangled kind of aspects of the history of the national and international, or this national international logic, um, that the, the really useful uh, point, I think, is that it flows both ways. Both that, that it, it tells us that internationalism in the 20th century, at least, I mean, we have to be, you know, historically kind of situated about um, these, these comments, but... Um, that internationalism in the 20th century was always somehow, you know, grounded in this, in the idea of the nation state. But at the same time, I do think that some of their historiography is also about, you know, alternative imaginaries and ambitions. You know, there was that wonderful article on the HR a few years ago. Um, uh, now, uh, the author's name from anyway has now escaped me. But anyway, so on, um, uh, you know, a Asian imaginaries and, and a kind of what you might call a kind of cosmopolitan view of what the possibilities of uh, internationalism are in the early 20th century, at least. But, you know, I think the other thing, it works the other way too. What I find interesting is the way in which if you suddenly, if you take that logic national international, then it also, if you take it back to the nation state, then it reminds us of the extent to which your point, you know, the nation state is embedded in, um, you know, processes of legitimation that are international, in economic systems, I mean, the people you kept talking about in the global history context, the peasant that, and I think uh, Chumil and others, that the peasant is located in these global, but not just global, but actually international in the 20th century, because they're intergovernmental organisations, but also non-state actors operating in those spheres economically, etc. So you've got the nation that's embedded in these um, international um, experiences, uh, relationships, power relationships, and that then you know, it becomes difficult for the nationalist, really, to, to articulate a narrative in that context that is the same narrative from the 19th century that they might have, you know, hearkened to. So, um, uh, so I think that, it, that it, this international history that focuses on internationalism or even on inter the international order, and I'll come back to that in my third comments, but actually does change the way in which um, we write about the nation state and therefore shifts the di nationalist discourse and the other thing I want to say is, um, you know, that uh, it also raises certain problems, I think, for the historian of internationalism um, in the sense of really untangling the, the history, international history from the history of globalisation. Um, and th this is, I, I want to take the example, you didn't read it out, but in the questions we got, we got an example of Hans Cohen, right, as a... So this great, you know, father of nationalism, so-called, unless there were earlier mothers, which we can find. Um, so the uh, Hans Cohen, you know, writes about nationalism, and then 
you know, there's a biography of him that I had. When, when I read that comment, I thought, oh, is he really an internationalist? I didn't know. Anyway, so we looked at, his, uh, at a new biography of him, and he was a Zionist. And he was also a member of the Modern Parliament Society after the Second World War. So we go back to this kind of, where does the history of globalisation fit? And, and Quinn Slobodian's recent book on, um, you know, the extent to which neoliberalism comes out of international institutions that are being influenced by these economic actors. And, you know, I'm currently working on um, uh, climate change and, and environmental history in the 1970s. And it's very clear that multinational corporations are, are, are being incorporated into these international institutions in ways that you would not expect. And you know, it's understanding that, understanding what the international is, is now as important to us, I think, as understanding what the national is in these very complicated ways and the different kinds of actors we find. So for me, you know, this entangled history means that I am, um, you know, that it's not just about internationalism and nationalism, but actually it's really much more about these different actors at national and what we might call it global levels and how we incorporate them into an, into our theorising of either nationalism or internationalism. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So I just add to what has been said. Um, uh, for me, and there are many answers to this very important question, how this international point of view has uh, an effect or an impact on the way we look at nation. I mean, for me and from my point of view, which was a social state, uh, the first thing that I have to say is that it helped me to denationalize the nationalist discourse around the, uh, the, the social state. Because of course there is, and, and we know it now with the Brexit and everything, you know, that the social state is heavily nationalized. By the, uh, in particular, by the state and by the government, because it's a, it's it's as you said, uh, it's it's a way to legitimize yourself. But you legitimize the state by comparing to other nations and by saying and so on and so forth. So the thing which I found so interesting by going from the German social state to the international labor organization, so really jumping from one national place to an international space, that uh, it helped really it helped me to denationalize uh, the. Uh, the the social state. And the other thing is that it also helped me to look more at the dark side of the social state. So, because there are other ways to internationalize the social state. It's, a, it's for example, the Nazi way. Uh, and the Nazi way was really to export the so-called German model to other countries. And it's a dark side. It's another international way. So even internationalism is not always this kind of good. Inter it's, you, were, uh, you were pointing to that with a um, um, multinational corporation, of course. It's not always you know, this kind of good internationalism. You also have this thing. So, and the second thing I want to point to is that um, uh, internationalism um, uh, re led me to um, reevaluate certain actors that I don't find so easily when I look at the national way of, uh, uh, as a national social state. Uh, I will, uh, the experts, of course, this has been studied a lot, you know, the experts in international organizations, the experts as a group, as an epistemic community, and so on and so forth, and the way they exchange to, uh, with each other, but also um, networks which are less studied, like, for example, social democracy. Social democracy as an international network, it is not very, very... Uh, preeminent when you look at the, at the uh, 20th century. But in fact, you know, really, if you look closely at the way the social state has been internationalized, not only in international organization, but also uh, generally, then you find a lot of social democrats. And this network, uh, I have discovered this uh, interaction between this national uh, national social state and this international went through this network of social democrats. So it was very important and also you have the Christian Democrats of course. So you have you know, all these uh, parties on, uh, that we study nationally uh, which become very international if you look at in particular the social state as a kind of international and inter-exchange in a way um, uh, 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 product. So. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Should we um, make an attempt maybe to, to link this second panel to the first? Remember, we, uh, the three of us on the panel in the first session, were asked about methodological nationalism.
and Eurocentrism and uh, about the degree to which uh, this haunted the history of uh, the study of nationalism. So, so mainly, I mean, methodological nationalism, is that, is that something that um, is a concern uh, for the study of internationalism? Uh, that would be the main question. If you feel like also addressing the other um, aspect, uh, Eurocentrism, is that something that uh, in the field of international history is a concern or, or maybe not a concern or, but a problem? Uh, whatever you think uh, would also be welcome. Nicola, are you prepared to go first, or are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Um, if if I could offer a, a slightly tangential response to the question, because sure. my my recent work hasn't been in, in international history, and what I have been thinking about is the history of knowledge, um, an emerging field, of course, um, over the last twenty years or so, like so many others, a sort of driven, I suppose, by a present driven appreciation of the exponential rise in significance of knowledge and its distribution, but also an awareness that although there's masses of work on, on all these questions, um, the historiography is very kind of fragmented into history of science, medicine, education, the disciplines, history of the book, history of institutions, of intellectuals, political thought, etc. So the, yeah, there's a massive body of relevant material, but it, it is very kind of divided, quite small, uh, scholarly communities who they're beginning to talk to each other more, but there's still a lot of um, work to do there, I think. Um, and of course, you've also got a transnational, global, and imperial historians thinking about all these questions a lot over the last couple of decades, thinking about how configurations of knowledge shape the scope for agency and sovereignty and solidarity in multiple ways all over the world, especially in this context of empires. So I think perhaps there's now a potential to kind of bring the insights of all this work um, in the history of knowledge, but particularly in the history of science, which is very methodologically um, pioneering, I think. Um, and we could bring this to bear on thinking about nations and, and kind of build on the um, famous conception um, from Anderson of the nation as, as an imagined community and, and sort of use this work in the history of knowledge to kind of deepen and extend um, that conception. Um, because I think it does, for history of knowledge does provide a, a way of thinking in very specific, located, material terms about how the forces that you could call national, you could call international, you could call transnational, how they interact, they clash, they intermingle, um, how they, how they create connections, but also how there are blockages, how there are continuities and ruptures. The history of knowledge provides a, a kind of situated way of, of thinking through some of these questions. It's, it's one window onto them. I'm not saying, of course, it's the only one, but I think it's one quite valuable window onto them. And my final point about it would be that as it's a field of inquiry which is emerging very much in the wake of post-colonial and decolonial theory, there's perhaps an opportunity there to build a set of, of non-Eurocentric concepts and tools. Do you, do you think that that uh, specificity that you're now alluding to is is due to the fact that the, just the archive is different, that it's less state-produced sources that uh, that are used? Well, I, I think I think the strength of it really is that t to do it well, you need to look both at state archival sources mm. and at, at 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 other sources. So if you're thinking about the history of education, for example. You know, there's a whole mass of material produced by any kind of state about education. But to understand what's happening in education, well, even to understand what's happening in schooling, um, you know, you need not only to look at the state archives, but you need to look at a whole series of other other archives that are, are becoming available. So it's to me, it, it's the combination that makes it makes it potentially so exciting and valuable. So. Um you know, I think if, if we look at the history of internationalism, it's clear, and those of, you know, we all know that you know the, the probably the most um, interesting and uh, uh, influential trend in that has been the, the the association of internationalism with imperialism, right? The extent to which international institutions, if not the, and even the international imaginaries, you know, whether Duncan Bell's work on Britain and um, an imperial imaginary, and, and, and that's been taken up in the context of the League of Nations. And I know one of the papers that I read for tomorrow in the workshop also, uh, I think, 
talks about these imaginaries in alternative ones uh, in terms of um, uh, visions of you know kind of federalism and 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 uh, larger kind of um, uh, political bodies. So, but of course you know a bit like you know how um, Chamil described you know the politics of of anti-colonialism and imperialism in the you know at Lausanne. Um, and I think it's all right to say Lausanne if it's something bad. <laughs> and, uh, so um, that you know, we can see that happening in the in this uh, in this kind of international field as well, uh, in terms of you know um, invocations of, of internationalism and, and those ambitions. But you know, for me, the big, the other question or possibility it raises, and this comes back, and now I'm going to take up Shamil's other point about the crisis of global governance is that it, it does return us to the question of where is politics, right? Where is economics? Where is politics? Where are all these um, dimensions of, of you know, um, existential dimensions that we have with historians and social scientists you know, in the 20th century long associated with the nation state or the state only, and now we've started to think about where else it occurs. And, you know, so the exciting thing about um, the new international history that does look at international sites is that it allows to see politics take it allows us to see this in, in an anachronistic way the politics that occurred outside of the nation because they couldn't occur in whether women or anti-colonialists etc. Mm -hmm. So for feminist historians, huge leap in terms of understanding the political um, the, the the complexity of political history not only in the 20th century but in the 19th. I've just been um, just finished a book on the end of the night of the Napoleonic Wars. And you know, and it's very clear that in the context of the Congress of Vienna, etc., the politics between states, this space between states, is already seen as a really rich and important um, space for uh, representing and demanding um, a specific interests, whether you're women or men or uh, you know a, a business person, etc. So we've got a um, you know a political history that we haven't seen when we've only looked what's happening within states even though, of course, the state is an important space. So it's about recuperating these other spaces and, and to go back to the, you know, the economic question uh, that, um, uh, you know, that has come up across these uh, three, you know, three of us. You know, I think that's the other rich space. So you know, if you want to understand Eurocentrism, maybe you want to understand you know, European businesses, you want to understand Western businesses, you want to understand how they operate and, uh, and influence knowledge making, absolutely knowledge making in the 20th century about the environment, about climate change, etc. And, um, you know, so I think this focus, specific focus on the international um, uh, institutions, at these sites at which politics and economics is made by actors we might not have expected is a really important part of both understanding Eurocentrism or you know imperial influence etc in the 20th century but in terms of methodological nationalism you know I do think that you know to go back to the idea of spring cleaning which this is I, I feel like this is what this conference is about you know mm -hmm. spring cleaning mm -hmm. and understanding the shortcomings of what we had before and really reflecting on them and, and just beginning to do that I I do think the one aspect that I've always found most challenging in, in terms of nationalism is in fact around subjectivities. And that's always been the resistance point, hasn't it? Oh, but nobody really cares about the world. People care about the, nations, the nation, right? Well, this is where their loyalties are, so you're dealing with the kind of intrinsic human psychology. And whether, I've never really had much truck with history of emotions, but maybe that's the space that we're gonna to move to for understanding some of this in new global history contexts or international contexts. But really thinking about the sites of politics, thinking about the emotional history of politics, about subjectivities, I do think picking these up in new ways, re-theorising the national in the context of the international. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in methodological cosmopolitanism, but maybe that's, you know, that's one way, there may be others. But really, um, starting afresh is um, really what I'd like to see happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, for the last round of questions, I want to make a pledge to the nation. And, <laughs> and I think that it's very important and coming from the kind of internationalism and international spaces like the International Labour Organization, so 
going back to the nation, I think that we really have to take the nation seriously, uh, but not, under, not as, an abstract, uh, as an abstraction. And I was a little bit worried about the use of the term nationalism all the time, because uh, Cyrus was also making this point very clearly that you have the nation state and nationalism, and it's not the same, of course. So I will speak here now to the nation state. Nation state is not an abstraction. It's not only nationalism. Nation state is a concrete actor and a place of, a so of social construction. If you lose the nation state, you tend to lose these concrete actors. So that's why I want to make this pledge. That's why I, I ask this question about social history and global history. Uh, so coming from my field, which is uh, the social state, of course, uh, uh, all these measures are discussed internationally with, by experts and so on, so that we know. But they are all implemented nationally or locally. So it means for the people, social measures, social benefits, they are national or they are local. They are not international. They are not European. They are not uh, ILO driven and so on and so forth. So for the people themselves, of course, the, the, nation, the national space or the subnational space remains the space which protects them against globalization. If we don't understand that, we cannot understand uh, populism right now. So the nation, we have to take it seriously because of that, because it's important. It's important in connection with internationalism, but it is important. So how the nation state functions in that, uh, uh, in that extent? Of course, it is a redistributive instance, but it also shapes nationalism. It nationalizes the people. I mean, look at the way the British are voting for Brexit because of the NHS. Why? Do they really believe that the state is protected. Because it has been a long process of nationalization of the citizen through the national welfare state, through the national state, uh, social state. Identification of the people, all this expertise which is nationally produced and also which is nationally administra uh, the national administration of the social, and it is national. It is not international. There is no international administration of the social. It doesn't exist right now. So there is a whole process of nationalization of the people themselves. So there is a social history of the nation from below. And what I want to, OK, so I could be very long on that, but I don't want to, to, to multiply uh, the, uh, the example, because of course there are very <coughs> nice examples in, the, in Germany in particular, because the, na the nation state was uh, going hand in hand with the foundation of the nation state was going hand in hand with the foundation of the social state in Germany. So you see how all the documents, uh, administrative documents and so on and so forth, were produced in the, main, uh, main, uh, in the same time and how, in fact, the citizens were made Germans because they were socially insured, not directly by the state, but you had all these eagles on the, on the card and so on. So there is a kind of administration, a, a technocracy of the social state, which makes the people national. That's very important. So what I want to finish, it's this perspective from below, which is very important when you come from the international, you see this perspective from below, is unavoidable for understanding the endurance of the nation as a social reality. And it's very important for us as social scientists to not leave the nation to nationalism and to nationalistic propaganda. It's what I want to say. All right, that was almost a sort of political manifesto. Manifest. Manifest. Yeah. If you want to go into the details of the examples, you can go to Sozialstaat und Gesellschaft, Sandrine's book on uh, exactly this, yeah, uh, this uh, problem. Uh, thanks. These were a couple of avenues, um, I think, for us to think about when discussing that relationship between internationalism and nationalism or the nation state, uh, as we have uh, heard. We have time for a discussion. Uh, and I see the first questions uh, emerging. Um, is it possible to, to pool them? I, I, I think typically it, it, it works better with a panel. Um, and given the fact that there are many hands up already, uh, it looks like a good idea. So, so, uh, so, so over there um, is the first question. Thank you very much for sharing these uh, fascinating observations. I just have a question. 
concerning the level below the nation state that Professor Cott referred to briefly now. Um, in the previous panel, in this one, we have talked a lot about the nation state, we have talked about the global, the international, we haven't talked much about the local, the regional, the, the urban, the rural, and I'm wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit on where these, uh, this scale fits in this uh, story, whether there is um, a value in trying to connect the international and the local or the regional, and so whether you could share some thoughts on these things. Is it okay if we collect some? If it's technically and hygienically possible? You have time though, right? Yeah, yeah. It's There's just, I, I think that one question, then three answers is usually not, not ideal, don't you think? <laughs> so so let's, let's, let's take another one or two, and then, and then you can also pick. It's easier for you, right? You can just evade whatever yeah, question yeah. doesn't make. <laughs> yes, please. Select. Hi. Um, hello. I'm wondering about uh, sort of thinking about diasporic epistemologies and sort of forms of knowledge building as well as sort of black um, internationalism. So how do you see diasporic forms of knowledge making yeah. as well yeah. as um, diasporic approaches to internationalism featuring into these larger scholarly debates? Were you guys able to hear me? Really? Could you also just, sorry, to just briefly introduce yourself when you said it was my, my fault, I should have asked you to do sorry, it. Sorry, I'm Tiffany Florval. I'm on after this roundtable, so. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, but so yeah, just more so about sort of world making and knowledge making in terms of diasporic communities and then also thinking about those same diasporic communities involved in internationalism, quite frankly at the local level, which is what he, um, hmm. Should we, should we go one more? Yeah, Alex. Okay. This is very specifically directed to, to Glenda in terms of thinking about subjectivities of the international. So I, I had the good fortune yesterday of going to the ILO archives. Thank you, Sandrine, for some of the tips. Uh, which was very interesting because the subjectivity, I mean, I just looked through material quickly on South Africa, but it had very little to do with South Africa. The subjectivity is really driven by the logic and the imperative of the organization itself. And so I, I wonder to what degree kind of international institutions craft or constrain the subjectivity of internationalist actors in some instances. All right. Do you want to go first, Sandrine? No, I can answer one question. Sure, I, I yeah, yeah. That's... Know, since we are three, we can maybe share the questions. Mm. So I can answer one question about um, um, the local, uh, national and the local. It's a very good question, of course, and in particular for the social state, because it has been also implemented very locally, in the case of Germany, but also in other cases. So what I see, um, and it's, it's, it's more... Oh, I... Uh, it's more a, a, a general question than uh, really an answer to your question. I have the feeling that right now what we mean with local has changed a little bit. If we, if we go from the 19th century to the 21st century, the local is maybe less local and more communitarian in a certain way. There is a kind of communitarianization, if I can say something like that in English, um, uh, of fair, fair, fair Gemeinschaftung <laughs> in German. It, it, it's better in German. Uh, <laughs> um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the local. And it's something which I think we should look at, uh, how the local has changed with uh, uh, with, with, with globalism, and I'm really very interested in that. And to go back to the MNC, uh, MN, MNC I mean the multinational corporation, um, you see how they act exactly on these two levels. They don't act through the nation state. They avoid the nation state. They are very international and very local. That's a, uh, 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 everything they do is about that about avoiding the nation state and, and going local, going international or global and local. And it's absolutely fascinating to look at that, in particular when you, when you look at them in international organization, because they are so well organized, you cannot imagine it exactly. We do, we're working on the, uh, not the same archives, but uh, equivalent archives. It's just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And exactly this avoidance of the nation state is something. And I think that we have to, that's why I made this pledge for the nation state. We have to be very careful. 
by avoiding the nation state, we are going in this direction. Okay, so. So, um, uh, yeah, except that I was just thinking, you know, uh, Pierre Eichenberger and Thomas David's uh, work on the International Chamber of Commerce yeah. is actually, because that's one of those organisations that does develop this huge shadow bureaucracy, you know, yeah. mirroring exactly the UN, <laughs> but also, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but also, um, uh, but it's composed of national bodies, right? Yeah. So. But they're, yeah, they are national, but they are active also very locally. Okay, so, so it's a whole. Uh, it's but, a that, but I think that and the project. Um, uh, I actually think the work on micro and macro is being done, you know, really well already. That I was thinking again, if we go back to the AHR, the essay that Emma Rothschild did on that small, you know, French village and how the in the you know 18th century and 17th, 18th century and how the kind of global awareness of what was happening in the world kind of impacted on their li on the lives of you know this particular family. In fact, you know, so really trying to sort of track that a bit, but perhaps not enough in the modern. I mean, in some ways, you know, we haven't really done as much on the 20th century, I think, in, in, in that context. Um, uh, subjectivities and the international. It's, I'm really interested in that. I've been looking at papers of um, a particular woman work, who worked at the ILO. I'm not the first. That's been done a lot. But I'm actually, you know, I started out thinking I was going to call it economic internationalism a love story. Um, because I found that you know her private life and and her ambitions and you know, I'm trying to understand what these people want to get out of these international institutions, but also what the inter international institutions how they direct them, particularly if they're women who aren't able to find um, you know sites of um, uh, um, well, places to work literally and and to use their particular expertise. But um, I think that's you know a really prof profitable area of research and understanding. Um, what they bring to those institutions and how the institutions then reshape them. I mean, Karen Scar, um, we always have this problem with her name, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, in our, our house, there is a big project on, on the league that I think is trying to understand some of these, the relationships between the bureaucracy and the individuals there. Um, in terms of black internationalism, I do think that's a really important point. I think, and there was that, again, a really good forum in the HR on that um, uh, last year, I think. And, and, and it is, for me, a really good example, not the only one, it's probably a more obvious example of how one actually practices a methodological cosmopolitanism. And, um, and, and you can do it um, in different ways. Um, the, one of my postdocs, uh, uh, Sarah Dunstan, worked on um, internationalism in, in Harlem. And it, it's very clear you know, that uh, as the UN is sort of getting organised uh, through the um, 50s and 60s, that you know Manhattan and Harlem become uh, you know kind of almost competing sites of internationalism and of influence over the UN and its agendas, its international political agendas uh, uh, in that period. That's um, where Fidel goes there. Yeah, exactly. The so there's the in Teresa Harlem. Hotel in Harlem, yeah. Harlem, and there's the Waldorf. I think or is, is I think in um, or the Astoria. Well, oh, what is that in um, New in uh, Manhattan? So these two ends of the of the of the island. Um, so I think there are fascinating um, stories to tell that are internal to the history of internationalism, but also that come back to where is politics, right? Where is it being made and what kinds of impact? Where do people have to go to be political and what do they expect from politics at different historical moments? And so that's, again, to come back to being less anachronistic, right? I suppose... All I wanted to add was just a, a sense of real, really, I was wondering if other people share this sense of really being troubled by the concept of the local. I mean, if any concept is under theorised, I think, I think that is. Um, and, uh, and, and every time I use it, I don't want to and try to find alternative formulations which are very difficult to find uh, that aren't quite long-winded. I mean, I think Sandrine is absolutely right that we, perhaps first of all, we need a real historicisation of the concept. And then we might be able to move to a, a clearer theoretical understanding of it. But I think it, it, it's banded around so loosely. And the, and the opposition, the global and the local, I think really just, you know, it's, it's another formulation of the opposition you talked about, um, um, Sebastian, of um, the internal and the external. And, and, and how we get beyond that, you know, it, when you actually try to write about these things in five words that are different, you really struggle, well, I do. And, 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 and that, I think, points to a real problem in the way that we think about all these things. <laughs>
All right. Um, by the way, anyone in the uh, online audience is welcome to intervene as well. If you have questions, uh, write them into the chat and I, I can read them out. Um, let's take two more questions. Next round of two questions. We have many more. Um, how would you start? And, and then Christoph. I'm Lydia Walker, and I'll be up tomorrow. Thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating discussion. My question is on sort of in the international scale and power or influence. Um, so when I began uh, constructing an international history project, I was thinking in terms of my actors having a degree of advantage and privilege in that they could travel um, and at the same time, they were attempting to enter international politics because they saw that their own national government was not the answer. So uh, it became this kind of sort of duality between being too weak domestically and, and therefore needing to seek international attention, at the same time having a degree of access to uh, sort of international politics. So I guess this question is about the, about the different degrees of power versus weakness mm -hmm. in who can access the international, if we want to sort of use that as an abstract noun, um, versus who cannot, but also who doesn't want to. Like it's not accidental that uh, state governments like to construct certain issues as domestic rather than international. Thank you very much. I, I would like to make a, a more general observation and, and link it to a question. In, in both panels and also in Michael, uh, Michael's questions, we have sometimes a, a challenge, but I would say sometimes also a, a little confusing um, shift between uh, historiography and the kind of assessment of past uh, uh, questions, approaches, and also achievements of uh, historiography, nationalism and internationalism, uh, and empires and everything. And uh, in a way, the, the, the real history, I mean, it's a bit uh, naive, but I mean, the history of things that uh, we observe. I mean, the development of knowledge, the development of institutions, the development of the social state, and, and, and others. And I find that sometimes this kind of going from, let's say, an observation of, of uh, observers or a history of us, of historians, uh, to, uh, in a way, what happened really in, in, in the world, not easy. But one could also, uh, in a way, uh, transform it in a question. And this is a question which is much discussed in the media and by uh, political pundits and so. Is there a need for more history of internationalism or more attention to internationalism because there is a decline of sovereignty of the nation state? Uh, let's say during the 20th century, 21st century. And of course, that would be dif different in different areas of politics. But the question is, of course, also an interpretation of, say, uh, uh, do we need to, in a way, uh, uh, provincialize the, the nation state? I mean, uh, uh, we already had the question of the uh, early modern period. And when you talk to these people, they say, well, you have problems that uh, somehow there are other people's problems. And some people say we are going into some direction where there are so many actors, local uh, kind of uh, civil society actors, uh, movements, multinational uh, enterprises, and some uh, kind of uh, actors like Google or uh, uh, Amazon, which are not only enterprises, but they are in a way bodies that are more important in uh, impact than a lot of the states on the, in the world. I mean, this is a model which is a little bit uh, kind of populist. But still, um, it's also true for the history of globalization. Do we need a good history of uh, globalization and a good global history because the phenomena are more important? Or is it just turns in, time, uh, in terms of social and human sciences? I mean, with the examples we had today, especially, of course, I'm very much sympathetic to uh, talking about the social or welfare state as an example. Uh, 
Uh, I would say, uh, yes, there is a need for really going beyond the nation because there's something happening around it. It doesn't say that there was nothing before, but uh, it, it's a question of yeah, scale, of impact, and of, let's say, importance. And just to uh, Sandrine, I mean, the European Union impacts uh, pretty dramatically on social policies, even locally. And the, uh, the, the, the court, the European court, decides things that, are, uh, that would be uh, 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 impossible 50 years ago. Hmm. Should, we, should we take these up? Uh, one more. Uh, I, one I more? Can, yeah, yeah, we can. Okay, one more. So we can divide. <laughs> okay. okay. Not. Um, yeah, so uh, I was very interested in the question about the uh, international institutions, and I wanted to connect it up with a comment of Sebastian's uh, in the first panel about the uh, making sure that we don't confuse structure and connection, because I think that's so important when we talk about international institutions. It's really important to recognize the, that structure gives a certain kind of consciousness to international actors where there's a presumption of connection, which isn't necessarily there. And that presumption of, you know, the, lack, you know, the lack of connection shows up in many of the cases I think Sandrine was talking about. So I was, I was wondering if you could comment about that. Connect up the, the, the connect up the connection, connect up the comment about structure versus connection with the talk about international institutions of specific actors. Thank you. You want to go now or ask for yeah, yet another one? <laughs> no, I, 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 if, if, I can, uh, if I can begin, uh, okay, so I, I'm very happy with the question. Oh, yes, 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 I my mask and I was uh, There's so many things we have to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thank you very much for this question about international and so on. Of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, internationalism can be a resource for weaker actors nationally. I mean, think about the women in particular that we know it has been studied, but in particular the working class movement. I mean, think about uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto in 1848. It's not for nothing that uh, Marx was an internationalist. He was not an internationalist because he believed in internationalism but because it was a resource for the working class in order you know, to fight against capitalism. So, uh, of course, you're absolutely right. Then when we look at the way it really functions in international organization, and I've looked at the ILO, but also as a UN and so on as a League of Nations, then you, 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 be, you become to be a little bit uh, disillusioned in a certain way about how these weaker actors can really make their way into this international organization, even though they come with a lot of hope. And the, the ones, and we, we already referred to that, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but the ones who are really important in the UN now are certainly not the women, are certainly not uh, the working class movement even less, because even the ILO right now is a, an organization for employers. I mean, it's, not, it's no more an organization for workers. That's really, I mean, it's just incredible. So, um, so in fact, the ba these international organizations, and we have to be very clear about it, they mirror the balance of power, the international balance of power. They cannot change it. They cannot change this ba balance of power. And when we, when we talk about global, global history, globalism, and so on, of course, all actors are global. I had this discussion with Cyrus. But not all actors are global the same way. I mean, there are actors who, have, who, who can really have resources and have these resources from the global and others who have also tiny resources. Of course, if you are a, Bangla, a Bangladeshi worker in a, in, a, in a factory at the end of the, um, of the value chain, uh, you're not out of employed, so you, you have a salary. It's maybe better than to have nothing, but it's not the same than being you know, at the head of the corporation in New York or whatever. So you know, I think that the balance of power is very important, and the hopes that the people had, in particular in the 19th century, towards all these international and international organizations, and look at the working class movement. It, you're right. I mean, the Germans, uh, trade unions right now, because of Europe, I mean, all the uh, Selbstverwaltung and all these things, I mean, they are really in danger because of Europe right now. So, uh, and that's why they are becoming more and more nationalized in a certain way. So we have to look at that. Who gains from internationalism right now? And 
the, you know, the, the ones who would gain less or not at all. Mm. It's, a, it's a market. It's a market. <laughs> So I'm just thinking, you know, maybe we, you know, maybe we all need to do international history that um, is, you know, completely reconfigured by all these discussions. So I was just thinking, you know, in your way, the last question goes with Lydia's comment, right? I think they're the same sort of comment. But you could look at it. So there is that really interesting history that's been happening around the League of Nations and petitioning and how, in fact, you know, and then the argument with the founding of the UN about could individuals be represented or you have to go through the nation state. So it's always been about the nation state, of course. But, you know, you could look at it the other way and say structures, connectivity. In national history, the reason why people, women, anti-colonialists, you know, whether the African-Americans that Carol Anderson wrote about that go to the UN to get civil rights or the, you know, indigenous populations that go to the UN, it's because exactly your point, you know, that the national structures don't allow them the connectivity, right? So, the, you know, on the one hand, you know, who gets to go to Davos or not? Or actually, who gets to go, who gets to influence, you know, political decision making within national cabinets? So, I do think they're related. And the more that we relate these questions and ask them in terms of bigger, you know, um, you know really fundamental questions like, you know, what is, where is politics? What is, where is economics? You know, then we're going to actually think, you know, um, have a, a, a better sense of, uh, structures and connectivity in a connected way, right? And that don't don't reify the nation state, but don't forget it, or you know, go the other way around, you know, idealise the international either. Thanks. Um, I just I mean they're all great questions. Um, I just wonder whether there isn't a sort of residual assumption on connecting them, which is somehow still that internationalism is is, is kind of benign. And we think of it as a sort of benign force. I mean, Sandrine, you, you talk very vividly about the, the dark side uh, of this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, it come, it comes, what comes to my mind is all the material that's come out recently about all the connections between the different military regimes in Latin America and how they were all working together to help themselves, to help, um, you know, perpetrate human rights abuses um, aside from, from, from other, other connections. And I, I just think we, we need to kind of not make it, not make the, I, I think it's quite hard to get rid of that assumption in your thinking about internationalism mm -hmm. and, and that it, it's important to bear in mind that it's not always um, a tool of the week. Uh, I, I just, uh, we didn't answer the question of, uh, of Christophe, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry Christophe, it's uh, as usual, it's a very complicated question that you asked. It was much easier to answer the other question. So uh, the relationship between historiography and the real history, as you put it, uh, of course, it's a, it's a complicated, it's a very complicated story. And you know, I can. Of course, we historians are part of the world in which we are living, and we know that we do the history of the present. Everybody knows that. And um, and um, but um, about uh, this question of historiography. Um, and how we construct, because we construct a new field. It's what we're doing. We're, we're constructing a new field because we want to be part of this world. I, th I think so. It's really, it's really like that. We, we, and we are also part of a kind of marketization of our own field. So we have to sell what we're doing. So we cannot say right now, I don't know, I mean, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie is a peasant history and so on and so on, because nobody will listen to us. <laughs> so in a way, you know, this connection is also part of the way the discipline is organized right now. So it's, I think it's a very partial answer to your question, but I think it's part of this answer. It's part of an answer. Cynicism. You want to. You want to. No, add it's on? not cynicism. It's a reality. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's a, well, yeah. That's what I wanted to say. It's true. Yeah, but important question also. I mean, the, as as you said, it also pertains to the first panel, obviously. Um, all right, we have uh, time for 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 another round, and I think there were uh, all kinds of hands still visible. So so. One. Anyone else? Raise your hands. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you so much for a really, you know, thought-provoking session. 
Um, I'll uh, throw out two, and then you can pick up uh, whatever you think is, is, is more interesting to you. Uh, and they are, so the first one is this. Uh, Sandrine, you, you ended, uh, I think, the, the, the third round uh, by saying that the social state is, is basically really national, right? And I think this is, you know, this is certainly true, you know, and you talked about this too in your reaction. Um, at the same point in time, of course, uh, there are all sorts of different bureaucrats within each, you know, social bureaucracy, social state bureaucracy that need to be in contact with their, uh, with their con basically their, their, their counterparts in other, um, you know, parts of the world um, uh, for social insurance, social policy reasons, to, at the very least to coordinate certain things, right? Uh, so this brings me to my question. Um, can we consider these bureaucrats international actors too? In other words, is there a way of pushing the envelope of internationalism and thinking about certain actors whom we normally think of as simply and only and stereotypically nation state actors, in actual fact as also international actors? And the second thing is this, it just occurred to me at the very end. So, okay. So, so they are, you know, powerful actors, you know, uh, the, the titans of industry and of commerce around the world who work internationally and coordinate their actors in order to squeeze the very last that they can out of, you know, the, the global labor and, you know, and etc. This is certainly one way of seeing uh, one particular dimension of internationalism or of an international network. At the same point in time, um, we also have what appears to be the exact opposite, right? Which is the internationalism of the weak, who basically try to pull sources beyond the nation state in order to precisely push back um, uh, against the powerful. So how can we bring these two conceptually under one single hat? And um, is there a, is, what's the relationship between these two in terms of structures, <laughs> in terms of you know, key actors, in terms perhaps of time frames? So these would be two questions. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That, one. That's yeah, yeah. The, the, the quick ones. Um, <laughs> but, um, you next. Um, <clears throat> I have a question that I wanted to ask during the first panel, and then I thought it was too naive. And then the comment Professor Cott made about uh, the need to sell our uh, product somehow made me think that it might be relevant. Um, <laughs> since we have to somehow produce something that breaks new ground, that takes also a very, proposes a new strong viewpoint on, on specific facts and events, isn't there a tendency to move from one centrism to other centrism? And I'm thinking, for just to give an example, from the nation state or uh, Eurocentrism to uh, flow centrism, network centrism, international organization centrism. And the question is very practical. If you had to give some advice to young historians methodologically how to move to, to, to avoid to, be, to, 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 to write uh, a history that is centrist in any way, what that advice would be? Whoa. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, good question. Add global centrism, right? Which is a term that I think Fernando Coronil uh, introduced. Um, and Michael has another question. I just wanted to follow up on the on the gender question, which uh, which may seem tangential, but um, I, I noticed it too when assembling the panels. Um, uh, I, I, it got to the point where I could get out of it except by disinviting someone. <laughs> um, so, 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 so this is where we are. I, uh, I, I, but I, I mean, it, it, it does seem to be representative of, of a broader tendency, I think. Uh, and uh, however, I, I, I can't come up with a hypothesis why, why this should be so in this case. Whereas in many other cases, I think I, I can have a guess, uh, but, but, but here I can't. So I, I'd be interested in, in hearing your take on it. Um, perhaps extending it to, 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 the, to, to the field of nationalism studies, which uh, I think compared to other fields is, is, is disproportionately male-dominated historically, is my feeling, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so, so, so I'd be interested in, in this, not, not necessarily as an end in itself, but 
um, what it tells us about certain subfields and how they interact. All right, that's uh, yeah. the first question was complicated. Uh, no. uh, people said the first, last question was easy, says no, Sandrine. I, I Here we go. I have this feeling it's very easy to answer. You know, it's, it was, it's a follow up to, what, to, to the other question about internationalism of the week. I mean, <laughs> look, the first internationalist movements, I mean, not the first, but one of the, they were internationalist, uh, uh, internationalism of the week. I mean, the uh, uh, feminist movements were very internationalist from the beginning. I really have the feeling that we women, I, and I say we, of course, I mean, I, I, I build a community which is just imaginary, but in a way, it does exist. I remember the, our first conference in, in Oxford, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Only women, only women. Um, uh, <laughs> so, no, but I should have specified that yeah. in contrast to global history, right? No, we one, one could imagine these things that you say would also apply to global no, history. No, 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 because global history is very serious, of course, no? It's about global capitalism, it's about big actors, it's about that, it's about, I would say that, I would say so, and even labor history, for example, I mean, uh, that I know with, uh, with, uh, with Alex. Labor history, it's very interesting, I mean, what the women are doing in labor history, what the men are doing in labor history. So there are really fields, and where there, there is power, I mean, maybe it's a little bit too short, but, it does mean something. When, where there is power, in a way there is more made. And internationalism, international organization, and so on and so forth, they are powerless. They are powerless. A lot of hopes, but not a lot of power. And I think that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're trying to give... To, to, to maintain this hope. So, but uh, it's it's maybe maybe you will have another answer. But it's it's my it's my it's my it's my answer because of course I was from the beginning I was very surprised by that that we were all I mean uh, look at uh, Susan Madeleine you uh, we were all uh, coming from different places. It was so nice. It was so nice. <laughs> 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 you know, I do think putting ourselves under the sociological microscope, I do think, you know, on the one hand, that is a correct answer. And it relates to, to how, you know, international institutions now are associated with governance feminism. So in the social sciences, it's like, oh, yeah, that's what, you know, it's, women got to have an influence because they really don't have any power at all. But actually, there's another way of looking at your question, which is, you know, um, that there are global historians that are women that just not know, I mean... That's what they would say. Lynn Hunt would say, no one invites me. Um, Madeline would say, yeah, why well, I thought of that. I'm a global historian, right? And I, I don't use that category. Why I don't use it, I might have to ask myself. But, you know, so what makes a global historian? Is it just because you have a chair in it? Or, like, you know, who, what is a global historian? Being presumptuous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so who identifies? So I think there are, there are both, you know, there are questions about how things are divided up gen in a gendered way, but actually, or maybe just about perception, right? So gendered perceptions. So there is a bit of angst out there, I have to tell you, Michael. Not about this, I don't think. But about, um, I've heard it. People say, well, you know what, but there are global histories of women. Why aren't they invited? Why yeah. is it always yeah. someone else or someone else? we restrict ourselves to internationalism. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, but, but just to go back to um, oh, which centrism, I think you have to pick your centrism. Because I think the point is, right, we're all going to, someone is going 20 years down the line is going to say, you know, X was centrist in some way. But the point is, and it, uh, is exactly why, you know, I decided that I wanted to study, you know, think about international, internationalism. This is because it was there and we weren't seeing it when we only looked at nationalism, right? But of course, you know, that doesn't mean leaving nationalism alone. But you make choices about what you think the politics of history are and how you might intervene in a way to make a better politics, right? Because history is political. It's, yeah. it's you know, there for consumption and sale, but it's, also, it's political as well, right? Yeah. So, um, and then to Cyrus's point, but I think that's what I was trying to say. I think the picture you built is exactly the one that we need to be looking at, the complexities, because we want to be asking what is politics and where is politics, who does politics, you know, the really fundamental questions, and reimagining the sites of those politics, but also what constitutes politics, right? So I would actually say that is a really, that's why you want the blackboard, you want to draw it and start thinking about what it is as a global historian as well as an international historian or a national historian. If I can just add, because it was a question to the social state. I mean, maybe I wasn't unclear, uh, Cyrus, but I completely agree with you. Of course, I'm not saying that the social state is 
per se national. I think that it has been, first of all, it has been built very internationally. They compare, they really compare, and in particular the bureaucrat you referred to, it's what I call the expert, and these experts are very international. Even the very German experts who pretend to be very German are in fact very international, and you can follow them in international organizations and spaces and so on and so forth. But in the meanwhile, the social state is a very effective tool to nationalize the population. So these are both, and they're working together. And this, this is a way to look at the interaction between national and international. And I think that the social state is really a very good case study or a very good laboratory to look at this kind of interaction between both. So I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. So on the centrism, the centrism uh, so, so I guess the idea is we're always fighting the centrisms of the earlier generation, and all of these centrisms that we're using are strategic for a particular purpose, right? So, no, no, I was just trying to understand. So I think that's the advice she gives. Sure, sure. Well, I don't know if everything's centrist. I mean, I'm being a bit facetious. I just think what you're talking about is the politics of what you're doing. And the assumption, I think none of us should be arrogant enough to believe that we see everything, whereas people in the past didn't. In fact, what we find is people in the past saw the things we saw, right? But maybe that strand got cut off, or, 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 and it becomes relevant in different ways to your present. You know, they saw the problems with nationalism. They saw that historians and historiography fed nationalism, right? So how do you create new narratives? So, you know, part of what... So my politics is I want to create new narratives. Now, when I do it, I do it in a context of Europe because that's what I work on. But, you know, that's problematic for some people who think, you know, you've got to work on it elsewhere. So the question is, you know, deciding what your space is, what your politics is. Um, what we're going to launch at the EUI, and you'll all be invited at some point, mm -hmm. is a, a, a series of discussions on, you know, what is European history in the 21st century? Precisely because, you know, we want to do something with it that allows us to both think through provincialising Europe, but actually saying, but you know, does it allow us to write more cosmopolitanised histories, for example? Mm -hmm. So, um, just being aware is the main thing. You will get in trouble afterwards, whatever you do. <laughs> but not having enough women. <laughs> choose, choose the centrism you want to get in trouble for. Nicola, sorry, we uh, rambled right. on. I mean, what my bit of advice would be to keep reading books from outside your own period. Oh, yeah. um, you know, because things look so different, or sometimes they don't, from another period. But that sort of jolts you out of, of any sort of sense that anything is, but you know, any centrism, I think. It's a good, it's a salutary sort of way of um, thinking beyond that. So that's what I would advise. Um, on the gender question, I, I suppose my only observation is that if you go to conferences that are called transnational history rather than global, the gender balance looks rather different. And why that is, I can't answer. Also, entangled histories tend to be more equal. So what it is about the global that is particularly... Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. maybe it is, yeah. yeah. Um, and just up to um, Cyrus's point about the difficulties, obviously I, I completely agree with the difficulties of trying to think together about internationals of, of the powerful and, and those of the weak, but I think it's really important we do try to do that, because the, I, I mean, I don't know much about this, but it seems, you know, just from observation, it seems that the the right has learned a lot from the left strategies and, and approaches, so unless we think about them together, but we're going to, to lose some important insights and understandings. All right, well, thanks so much uh, to everyone, to the panel in particular, but also to uh, the audience for your, for your questions. So uh, before I have another sentence or two, let's first thank the panelists.